What's up, everybody, and welcome to Real Time for the Real Everyday Movie Fan. I'm Ryan Murphy. I'm Josh Williams. And I'm James Sheridan. And today we're talking about the future of the Star Wars franchise. We just finished our review of The Mandalorian. This is actually, this is just insane, guys. I mean, Disney, several years ago, bought this franchise for $4 billion, and they were like, we're going to milk the ever-loving crap out of this thing. They said, we're going to make a movie a year, then Solo Bomb, and they were like, eh, maybe not a movie a year, but hey, we're going to make 10 TV shows for Disney+. Plus. And but that's off are. the success of the Mandalorian. Here we are. We'll see. Yeah, but ten. I mean, what if one bombs? And they're like, "Oh shit!" Just like Solo, one move. All it takes is one movie or one show to bomb. And they're like, "Oh shit!" Let's <laughs> let's back up. But um, I mean, you have to understand that Disney Plus is trying to. Um, it's the new guy in a market that's really saturated with other streaming services, and they're trying to make a name for themselves. The big thing that's actually made them a selling point has been the Mandalorian almost exclusively off of the back of Baby Yoda as a character. Everyone wanted to tune in for that. Um, much the way, you know, shows like Stranger Things have made Netflix sort of a household name. Um, so it's not surprising to me that they actually wanted to do this many shows. Yeah. Um, because they now need, like, we've already had, you know, announced series for Marvel and whatnot, and they have other exclusives, but they need to make original content to bring people in because unfortunately you know some people have, already have all the disney movies i already have all the marvel movies and star wars movies so having a streaming service just dedicated to those doesn't necessarily make sense you need other content to bring people in and with the extreme success of the mandalorian and the popularity of baby yoda it's not surprising at all to me that they would double down on trying to create so many series at once and you know, I don't expect all of these to work out. Some of them are probably going to be one season, a couple of them maybe two. Um, I, I don't actually expect, you know, Mandalorian to go on for like a 10 season run, but... Um, I predict I, seven. I, <laughs> maybe, I don't know, five or six. I'd be happy with, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm happy as long as the story is still telling a story. Yep. When the series starts going on and, you know doing things that just you know like the last season of game of thrones i know they still had a story to tell but it was just such a disaster it's like why didn't you guys wrap up sooner i know you have you know like, <laughs> it just it doesn't it, it was so painful to watch and there's other series it just it keeps going and going and going and it's like supernatural right. which don't even get me started on that one i think the last three <laughs> seasons of smallville could have been issued and they could have you know the wrapped up early, although i like that it's <laughs> i like some of the later ones <laughs> Once they started yeah. getting into the this the um, Justice League stuff, I was actually I was even more invested. Um, but anyway, my point is that I think this is actually from a business perspective for Disney, this makes a lot of sense, even if they're just throwing things at the wall to see what sticks. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of stuff is going to be on Disney Plus is going to be more in the realm of uh, Dave Filoni and John Favreau's world. Like Kathleen Kennedy is still the the head person, so to speak, but. I feel like their hands are going to be in those cookie jars of the other series that were going to be on Disney Plus. And so we'll see how that all transpires. But one of the great things I feel like we were going to be talking about tonight, which we, you know, we have to start getting into it, is not only are we, for the future of Star Wars, we're not only getting stuff that takes place in the world of the Mandal like the timeline of the Mandalorian, we're also getting, we're going back in time, which is also very exciting for me. Like not just, we're going even before you know, the original, sorry, the prequels, we're going into what's called the High Republic, which to me, I'm very excited for. Like, well, I wish they would have gone into the Old Republic. Yeah, of course. Like, I, I wish they would have, you know, finally done more stories and like stuff from the Old Republic days, but who knows? Maybe when moving forward, we will, because you can do that now. Because, you know, they're trying to steer away from this, the Skywalker saga, and which I don't know about you guys, but I am perfectly okay with. Um, so let's let's kind of go into it here. Like, we'll, we'll talk about some of the stuff that's taking place not in the Mandalorian time frame, but let's talk about a lot of stuff that's taking place during it first, well, and we'll before, kind of expand from there. Yeah, before we do that, I want to just make a blanket statement that there are nine shows that have, they've announced. Um, Disney Plus first made an announcement that there will be 10 shows for Marvel and, D and, and Disney, for Marvel and Star Wars, but then they announced like 12 shows for Marvel, so I'm not sure if that's an exact number, but they've announced nine. And just to, just, just to make a sort of broad blanket statement first is The Acolyte, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Andor, Lando, Ahsoka, Rangers of the New Republic, The Book of Boba Fett, The Bad Batch, and Visions. Those are the nine series that are coming our way. So yeah, you want to talk about the, um, the Acolyte first, I suppose. 
Oh yeah, we can. I mean, I figure we can we can go either way because not only we um because I like to talk about not only what we're getting on TV and movies, but we're also getting a lot of books too because the High Republic is mainly going to be starting off in a book series. Mm-hmm. Where it starts off two hundred years, I believe, before the uh, episode one, and they even confirmed that Yoda will be a part of a young uh, young novel and young comic book series where it's going to be him training young Jedi. So we're going to maybe get a little bit of a uh, story involving Yoda as well. So that's going to be kind of very exciting for, for me personally. I just love the idea of going back more in time where the, where like, especially now, cause this is going to be like the height of the Jedi order where the Jedi order was at it's like, you know, it's peak so to speak, where the Sith are not really around. But when, but then you go into the Acolyte, which I'm assuming is going to be more gearing towards the underworld where it's following the Sith, the, the master and the apprentice kind of, moving through the underworld kind of underneath the surface kind of you know building their plans which who knows who's going to be the master and who's not i mean maybe it's going to take place about 100 years so maybe what is the padawan going to be um darth plagueis you know it's something we can maybe think about but what are you what are your guys' thoughts on the high republic do you guys looking forward to it all as I am? Like I'm kind of really stoked for it, even as you know, books and the TV show. But what are your what do you guys think? Well, <laughs> well, um, glad you asked. Um, no, I first of all, I, I, you guys know me as a fan of the EU. I'm actually looking something up as we're talking because I'm not sure the exact timeline. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, so it, back in like '97. Um, they did a, a, a miniseries called Knights of the Old Republic, which took place, took place 4,000 years before um, the Star Wars trilogy, 4,000. Uh, and then they went back in time and did a short story called Golden Age of the Sith, which took place 5,000 years before the New Republic. And, we, and, they, and you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi said in the first, um, in the first uh, movie that the Jedi were around for 1,000 generations, which would be like 20,000 or some 20 to 30,000 years um, and that's just of the old Republic of the Gallus. So we imagine how long this Republic's been around. Imagine how long this galactic, this galactic system has been around. There's a huge thing done back there. I'm not, I've, I haven't followed it since Disney bought it. Um, but I believe they've even gone back in time to the point where they're just using swords instead of lightsabers. Like there's issues of, of Jedi just using like metallic swords and stuff. So, I mean, like there's a huge amount to unpack. So you said, uh, 200 years that really surprised me um, because I was under the impression they were going like like thousands if not like dozens of thousands of years um, before uh, a new hope so oh no it's not before a new hope it's 200 years before episode one before the phantom okay, so excuse me 230 yeah <laughs> you know but still yeah but this is this is like when the time when Yoda's gonna be about maybe six seven hundred years old where he's Which for him is not that much yeah no it's not but yeah, and this is apparently from what they're promoting as that this is the height of the Jedi Order. This is like that their highest because back in the old Republic days is when they're constantly at war with the Sith until eventually. Now this is not canon uh, as of yet within Disney canon, but you know this is during the old Republic days. That's when Sith and Jedi were at war until eventually Darth Bane killed all the Sith and created the rule of two and went into hiding after that. So this is kind of that time frame where there's no Sith, there's no wars going on. So not only the Jedi Order, but the Republic is that it's, you know, at its height right now. So we're kind of going to see and explore that. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, what James, what do you think? What, are you going to read the books when they come out? Because the first one comes out at the beginning of this January, which I'm picking up, you know, right away. I mean, I'm always up to read stuff, but um, unfortunately most of <laughs> – I covered this in our um, – Mandalorian season two um, review, but I'm not actually a big fan of the EU and like I tend to be more movie centric and to a lesser degree show centric. Um, so most of this stuff doesn't really interest me. Like I've never played uh, Knights of the Old Republic. I know everyone loves it. It's the greatest story of all time. Um, it really it, is. <laughs> it, I, I'm sure it is. It just, it doesn't interest me. I'm actually not a big fan of Jedi um, as a sort of like storytelling point, um, my interest was far more centered around Skywalkers specifically, um, and more specifically the sort of rebellion empire era um, into the sort of Mando era. So like 
Um, even some of the stuff like they're they're talking about the Bad Batch is going to, which is going to be a spinoff of the Clone Wars. Not my forte, but I'm very excited because they are bringing out more in the sort of post Clone Wars into like throughout the Mando eras, um, which to me, outside of the actual trilogy, hasn't been explored enough, um, even in the EU. Um, like we had maybe one or two books in that era. Um, most of this stuff has, was, was like what's now Legends was, you know, post-trilogy stuff or pre-trilogy stuff. And most of the stuff they've covered since the prequels has been pre-trilogy stuff. All the stuff like that takes place in between the episodes um, of the prequel trilogy and a little bit afterwards including, you know, Rebels and Clone Wars and all that stuff. So I'm really excited that, you know, we're going to get Andor, which is a spinoff from Rogue One, which to me was one of the um, unsung heroes of the whole Disney era of Star Wars, because I thought it told a really tight, well-made story. It told a story that we are familiar with, and we know the stakes of, without them having to go deep into that, because we've already seen the original series. Um, And they made us fall in love with all these characters who spoiler alert, don't make it to the end of this movie. And um, I do think it's kind of fascinating that they're going to be doing a series based on one of those characters. Not the character I would have hoped for, but, you know, that is what it is. Um, They've also announced that they're doing Lando, which, I mean, I'm always down for um, Donald Donald Glover Glover doing whatever he wants to do because he's Donald Glover. And I don't think he got enough screen time in Solo. Um, because they kind of sold the movie on the idea that it was going to be like their relationship a little bit. And it's like, it is there, but it's like, he kind of like disappears for like large chunks of the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think a series based on him might be kind of fun. But the three that really um, got me excited were Rogue Squadron, Mm -hmm. because I absolutely love- Patty Jenkins. Patty Jenkins, but more than that, my favorite thing about Star Wars was always the dogfight stuff. Um, I was telling Josh this off um, camera or in between recordings that um, to me, the trench star run is my favorite scene in all of Star Wars. I think it's the most, one of the most well-made one of the most well edited and you know, other people's opinions may vary. You don't have to agree with me. That's fine. But to me, it's absolutely one of my favorite scenes. Um, It solidifies Luke as a hero and, um, I just think like the pacing and the effects and even the old janky effects, just everything was great. Um, Gore, just... And I've always thought that the um, prequels and sequels didn't do enough sort of like aerial dogfighting style. Um, Return of the Jedi did, but they were focusing more on Luke and what's happening on the planet. And the dogfight stuff was all, almost tertiary. Um, well, the best scene in the prequels like... is the opening of episode three. Except that's not a dogfight, that's a chase scene. Yeah. It's set up as, as sort of like a, you know, cowboys on a train sort of, or like, you know, um, two cowboys on like horses, you know, chasing a stagecoach or something. It's not so much um, a dogfight as it is just, you know, the, they're, they're riding in a straight line the entire time. There's not really <laughs> a lot of maneuvering and whatnot. Um, I think that was one of the appeals of Rogue One towards the end, that dogfight scenes out in space. Yeah, that was one of my favorite things was just, like, you got to see Blue Squadron, who, you know, if you know anything about the history, Blue Squadron was originally going to be Red Squadron, but they couldn't get the blue to work on the blue screen, so they had to paint all the ships red, so they changed it to Red Squadron. So, canonically, Blue Squadron was supposed to be at that battle at Yavin, um, but now we know they weren't because they all died trying to get the Death Star plans to begin with. Which again, fucking, I love Rogue Squadron, or I, I love Rogue One so much. Um, so I'm super excited for Rogue Squadron because um, those games were great. That storyline was great. I'm very excited to see, you know, um, I, I would love to see Wedge Antilles more on screen mm-hmm. because again, a character that's horribly underdeveloped. I, yeah. Obviously, they're going to have to recast because um, Dennis yeah. Lawson is way too old at this point <laughs> and whatnot. And- um, yeah, they sorry, did. They, did touch, they touched on him a little bit in Rebels. I mean, I don't want to spoil anything for Ryan again, but I did like that. That was in there. That was the best part yeah, of the, the Rise of Skywalker was was seeing uh, was seeing Dennis Lawson actually come back as as uh, 
as uh, as wedge antilles but again you guys aren't um, uh, james maybe a little bit more but not i mean you, you've made it clear you're not a huge fan of the eu uh, one of the big aspects of the eu is the rogue squadron series of books yeah uh, in which wedge antilles is one of the central characters uh he's yeah. the leader of, of rogue squadron which are extremely acclaimed um uh books uh so i guess we segue into talking about <laughs> yeah well i mean go back to go back before we go off on those yeah talk about the other ones i guess i know josh be, is really excited for the acolyte Josh well, really I am you. very excited for that. And not, and not just because of that, I'm very excited for the High Republic area itself. Because we I think this is the reason why I love Old Republic and now the old um, Knights of the Old Republic and Old Republic itself is while I love I love Star Wars, I love the trilogies, I love the whole Skywalker, that, that whole time frame, you know, from episode one to episode nine, or, or yeah, um, and that whole gap in between there's always these characters that are in it that we're familiar with. And it's sort of that familiarity that keeps us loving them, which I still love it, by the way, I love it. But I think the reason I also very much love things like the Old Republic and now the High Republic that I'm anticipated for is we're getting, besides Yoda, brand new characters, brand new things to explore, going back into history, learning more lore. I mean, that's what the first, the first uh, book of the High Republic is called Light of the Jedi which to me just excites the hell out of me. Like we're getting more backstory now, more meat to the bone that for me might make, make things more, I don't know, I want to say important, but more, I don't know, it just adds more meat to that, to that lore of that, that actually have more impact for the, um, the other films and stuff we already know. So that, that just to me is why I think I, I love those time frames. And so now that we're getting it, it excites me. Like we're gonna see whole new characters, whole new journeys, whole new more lore. I think that's I, I don't want to go back on the Mandalorian, but that's why I love the Mandalorian because we're visiting all these planets that we'd never heard before. I mean, we have heard of them, but we never actually saw on screen, like Tython, which is one of the original planets of the Jedi Order, like was known as one of the original planets and is one of the big focal points of the original the old republic. But mm -hmm. I don't know that for me, I, I know you guys probably aren't as excited for it, but that's for me is I mean, guess I love Knights of the Republic, and so now I'm falling very much in love with the old Republic game. So this, that's just why I'm very excited for it. I'll probably be reading all the books, the comics, and even Acolyte coming out. And I've heard, like it's not confirmed yet, but I heard that's the reason they're releasing these High Republic books is because they want to make a High Republic trilogy, the actual film trilogy. But these books are just sort of your introduction into, the, the, into this world to then segue into a, TV, to, into a movie series, movie trilogy that would make it everything canon. But anyway, so that, besides that, we can kind of move forward here. Um, there's besides um, the besides that, there's two series that I'm extremely excited for that we can probably talk about. There are two different time frames. One, of course, is Ahsoka. I mean, we talked about it, Mandalorian. I mean, me and James are, you know, extremely excited for that. I don't want to go, you know, be too <laughs> vulgar. I don't want to be too vulgar, but we're, you know, we're just let it out. We're shitting in our pants, ready for this. You know, we got hard, we got hard ons ready for a Soka show. But what I'm very <laughs> excited okay, for, hard, also, I am excited for it. Hey, when I saw Soka, I went from six to midnight. When I saw Rosario <laughs> <laughs> on live action, <laughs> you, were anyway. saying, like, you were saying online like she needs a spinoff, and like the next day, you're like we're making a spinoff, and I was like, John has got to be like, holy shit, freak the fuck out. <laughs> but what I'm also excited for that, that we didn't really touch up on the Mandalorian show was we're finally. And uh, finally getting an Obi-Wan series when he's on Tatooine. And not only that, but Hayden Christensen is returning as Darth Vader, which I'm personally <laughs> extremely excited for. But Josh is for. rinsing so hard right now. Like he's cringing. Or James. Because... No, James is, yeah. James is, yeah. We don't have the, the video up, but he's cringing for some reason. I, I love I love that Josh is the only person in history to be like, Hayden Christensen is back. Yes. I, in my defense, I'm, I'm excited that Hayden Christensen is back. I think the guy did not get his... Um, he, he's a better actor than the prequels give him credit for yeah. I think the problem with his performance is George's direction which is traditionally lacking um, I think yeah. that he is a very gifted individual who unfortunately got a very bad rap after the prequels um, and didn't he, like his career kind of tanked and it's like I really wish this guy had got a better chance at doing yeah. some like if he got you know a, a, an MCU role or something I think that would like rejuvenate him or if he got it in you know some anything. sort of franchise I mean, or he's, anything yeah. like I would love to see his resurgence so him coming back in Obi-Wan is exciting the reason I wince at it is because Vader traditionally is played by two roles his voice and performance is done uh -huh. by James Earl Jones everything mm -hmm. about the character 
the darkness, the, the, the edge to him is all in the voice performance. Physically, he's played by a bodybuilder. Yeah, and Hayden yeah. Christensen, as, as great and good looking and muscular as he might be, is not a bodybuilder. And one of the things that's always irked me is the, the shot at the end of Revenge of the Sith when Vader's standing there looking at the Death Star being built and he crosses his arms. Dave Prowse could not cross his arms. His <laughs> arms were goddamn tree trunks. He can't yeah. move like that. That's why his hands are always on his hips when he's Vader. So I think that the physicality is something that I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that they're going this route because neither of the reasons I would go with Hayden Christensen um, like he wouldn't, he's not physically big enough to be in the suit. And because they would use David Prowse's voice for the voice, he's not going to be doing the performance. So like it kind of negates his reason for being there. The only reason I would be excited for him to be there is if they took the helmet off mm -hmm. and we see his face. And his face yeah. is, yes. Because then that's why you like, that's why you have him back is to see who like, this because is it is, it is known he takes off his mask. Like in Empire Strikes Back when he's sitting in his little meditation huh. cube, uh, thing, mm -hmm. he takes off his mask every once in a while. Yeah. But I think going back to what you're talking about with George Lucas' direction is that's very true. Like not a lot of people know this when you kind of peel behind the curtain and go on the filmmaking aspect is George Lucas, like a lot of people had complaints where, oh, he was just so wooden when he talked. George Lucas was the one who told him to talk like that. They wanted him to be on the same cadence of talking styles that Darth Vader was in the original trilogy. Well, also, was, George Lucas is kind of a terrible director. I mean, he, he, he's always struggled with... <laughs> he, he's a good storyteller and an yeah. excellent editor. He no, is he a quit terrible directing director because the, the, the reason he directs is to edit. Everything right, he, he does as a director is to edit. Yeah, but he, he quit directing after the first Star Wars. That's why he didn't direct the second or the third. That's why he didn't direct the Indiana Jones trilogy it's, or it's, Willow. It's because just because he, said, he had a nervous breakdown that hospitalized him. Yeah, but he also said, like, I'm done with this. I, like, they, they joked during the making of the first Star Wars movie that all he would ever say was faster and more intense. Uh, he, he couldn't communicate with people. Uh, he, he struggled writing dialogue, which is why he also didn't write the screenplay for the Indiana Jones movies or the Star Wars sequels. He just said, I just want to go, I just want to write the story, be executive producer, guide it along, and, and have that role and, and bring my story to the screen. The same thing with Willow. Um, Creative genius. All those things. Yeah. yeah, he's a creative genius, but th that's when he was best. And then 20 years later, he said, you know what, maybe I'll try writing the screenplay and directing again. <laughs> uh, and everyone wishes he hadn't. I mean, Nat Natalie Portman uh, has openly stated that she really struggled with her career. Her director in Closer, uh, Mike, the, the movie Closer, her director in that movie, Mike Nichols, had to write her letters of recommendation saying, ignore the Star Wars prequels. I promise mm -hmm. you she can act. And of course, eventually she won an Oscar. Uh, even Ewan McGregor sucks in those movies, I think, and he's a great actor. Why Gon Jim oh, is an absolutely yeah. gifted actor. <laughs> Liam Neeson, just an absolutely stunning actor, and half of his lines in that movie are just garbage yeah. because he's just so it, it's like talking cardboard like there's a there's a scene where there's a moment where in an interview you mcgregor talks about when he has to say that line where he saw holograms of anakin killing younglings that moment where he covers his mouth is him stop trying to stop himself from laughing because the line yeah. apparently made him outright laugh every time he said it he couldn't help it so he harrison has ford's curious... famous harrison ford's famous line was you can write this shit but you can't say it yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, but let's, it's... we got we got off on a tangent here but that but talking about the obi-wan series is, is the fact that also Hugh mcgregor is coming back yes we're gonna see you now he's at that perfect age now we're, we're gonna get it uh, they haven't said what time frame it's gonna be in but i, well, I mean a, we I, know it's got to be between episode oh, three and four <laughs> no obviously but we don't know like if it's like when luke's still like a child or if he's like preteen. like we don't know where it's gonna be starting off at what I would love to see in the show, because we don't know what we're going to get. I mean, obviously, oh, we can't talk about that because spoilers, because Ryan has not seen Rebels. So um, there's one thing I would like to still see in live action between him and a, diff and a certain character. Asajj but... Ventress? That's the one character I know from Clone Wars. Man. No, you, you yeah. know this character. You do, but we're not going to spoil it for you. The fuck? But anyway, I would love to see it in live action. But other thing I would okay. love to see... Here's a, here's a little kind of little history within the original uh, movie. Like when I remember when when Obi Wan rescued Luke and C three PO and R two from the sand, the the sand people. 
I love the, the line where he says, you know, they'll be back in greater numbers. I would love to see moments where he fights against the Sand People and they come back with greater numbers and he fights them again. Like stuff like that would be fun to see kind of kind of like a, a play, like kind of a um, like a, a, a nod. A nod to it because, you know, he has this knowledge because of that. You know what I mean? Stuff like that would be perfect storyline threads to include in this show. Mm-hmm. But I'd also like to see him go by the name Ben because that's something that bugged me in the how, prequels. How and why? Set. Like, we, we've established that his name, in, like, everyone go, refers to him as Old Ben. Even Leia calls him Old Ben. But at yep. no point in the prequels has he ever called Old Ben. So how the hell does Leia know him as Old Ben? If he was just a hermit called Old Ben, Luke would call him that. But, like, Leia named his son or her son after this man and we never hear him called old ben i think yeah and, and also the big question is through this time when he's watching luke does he ever introduce himself or does he just watch from afar you know what i mean because it seems like luke knows him in the original film or knows of him or knows who he is so maybe they had some interaction but his uncle well i think it's this i think it's the small town like old codger kind of thing like when you live in a small town you know everybody you don't know them personally but like you know some people by reputation and like the way luke refers to him is you know um old you know (laughs) i don't even remember the line but like the way he refers to him is very specifically it sounds to me like you know it's just the old crazy man in town Mm -hmm. who sometimes comes in town to pick up you know wampa burgers well, let me, it's obvious. It, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I was just say obviously we know he's just going to stay on Tatooine the whole time because his goal is to protect Luke Skywalker. Yeah. yeah. So, but what, Ryan, what do you think about the show? But Darth Vader is coming back, and Darth Vader ain't going to Tatooine. I mean, that's my that's my thought Darth is like Darth Vader going to be on Tatooine if he doesn't know his son there. So his son, yeah. his son is there. So I mean, it'll be interesting. My first thoughts when this um, when this was announced was really I mean your your thoughts apparently were woohoo and my thought was were like really like. Ben sitting, getting crusty on uh, Tatooine. Do we really need a story about that? <laughs> um, we'll see. I know. So I, I, who knows what the series is going to bring. I feel like it's going to be a very good – because we haven't got this – because everybody knows that Star Wars isn't Shakespeare. I mean, it's not meant to be. It's not something that's – other than Empire Strikes Back, which is the only real, I feel like, strong script of a storytelling aspect. I mean, Star Wars is mostly a fun space story. You know what I mean? So, but I feel like this is the opportunity we might have to actually have a psychological character study on Obi-Wan Kenobi just living out his life on Tatooine, you know, trying to protect this child. And who knows? He still might. And Tatooine's a very, it's in the outer rim. It's a very dangerous place. So who knows what Luke might get himself into that Ben's going to have to, in the shadows, take care of in order to keep this kid safe. Well, we're we're assuming that Luke is going to be involved in this. I feel like, like he should be. I feel like he honestly, if not like an actual, like at least you see him every now and again in the show because he's going to have to be able to keep up on this kid to know. Riding he's around in this T sixteen, shooting rats. <laughs> you know, like I feel like you're going to have to have. I'm just afraid of. I'm, I'm just afraid we're going to have another Jake Lloyd situation where we're going to have, like, again, Jake. I have nothing against Jake Lloyd or his performance. Um, I think he took way too much crap for what happened in those movies. He wasn't a good actor and his performance wasn't good, but he had nothing to work with either. And he's a kid actor. It's his first like major role. He'd been in a few other movies. Jingle all the way. But he was like a side character. Like he was a (laughs) secondary character. This is him carrying, supposedly carrying a movie. Um, And I don't think he was helped at all. And I think that, um, we know that he went through extreme bullying um, after these films, and I feel really yeah, bad for him. And I don't want to see another kid go through that because fans are merciless to kids. So unless this kid is like really charming and really fun, which isn't Luke's character, um, I don't know that they're like. I don't know that I necessarily want. Like, I wouldn't mind Luke if if he's like sort of a peripheral character. Like we, we, we see them reference him and we see him sort of in the background, like Obi-Wan's watching him. But I think that much of this story is going to have to take place off world because we know Vader's going to be part of it. Um, Vader going to Tatooine is going to be really troublesome for canon reasons because he would obviously sense his own son there. Yeah. Uh, he would sense at least, at the very least, a very strong force sensitive person. We know from canon that he's looking for force sensitive people yeah. for various schemes that he's working on. Um, a couple times, you know, he's even trying to train his own apprentice, um, you know, um, and like, 
in order for Obi-Wan and Vader to meet, they have to be off planet. I don't know if this is a fan theory or if this is canon anywhere. I'm trying to remember where I, I got it from, but I've actually read that um, like part of the reason that Vader stays away from Tatooine canically is because of like deep seated trauma about, you know, his mother was murdered there. He was, you know, treated like shit the entire time that he lived there. It's nothing yeah. but bad memories. Like it's horrible childhood for him. Yeah. Nothing but bad memories. He would never want to go back there. So I think that um, whether or not that's actually accurate or not, I think that there is some truth to it. I do think that Obi-Wan's adventure is going to have to be off planet somehow. Um, and, you- and he's going to have to come back to the planet at some point. Like this is going to be an adventure that pulls him away from there. It also, you, know, you, you guys are talking about how long it has to be before New Hope. It has to be a pretty long time before New Hope because remember, like, Obi Wan does it's say. It's been 20 years since the prequels, man. I know, but like, the, the Obi Wan does say in the first movie, I sense something, a presence I've not felt since last week. No, no, it's, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very true. And that's why I feel like maybe when Luke is. I don't know how it's going to work out with the writer. We don't know if we're actually going to meet or if it's going to be just flashbacks or we're just going to cut to him every once in a while. You brought up an interesting point that I think we, we might predict about or we, we discuss because we know that during this time there are a bunch, a shit, shit ton of inquisitors looking for force sensitive people. Mm-hmm. Could this be an indication where we don't necessarily see Obi-Wan or Darth Vader meet up necessarily, but we cut to Vader to where he seeks has, you know, his inquisitors finding force sensitive and maybe one of these inquisitors goes to Tatooine or somewhere close by and Obi-Wan finds out about it and goes to kill them to prevent them from getting to Tatooine. Luke, it does raise some questions as writing for the show. <laughs> it does but, raise some questions as to why no one like Luke stayed safe. Like we know Obi-Wan's protecting him, but is he somehow shrouding the force so that people can't true. protect him or something? Like is that part of the story and journey? Is he like did he like because we know he learned something at the end of Revenge of the Sith about becoming a forest ghost from Yoda who learned it from Qui Gon. Yeah. Um, but did he unlock other secrets that we don't know about in these films as well? Who, um, like, does he know how to sort of hide his presence in the Force? Is this why no one's found Obi Wan, even though they're hunting former Jedi and new yeah. apprentices? Is this why no one's found Luke? This now, is, of course, there, this is a backwater planet, too, so it could just be mm-hmm. the excuse of no one went looking there. Yeah, it could very well be. Like, that's what kind of excites me, because we just don't know what we're going to get. It could go a very deep, just very deep character study, where he's just kind of looking after him and, and going on little tiny adventures on Tatooine, or it could be where it's a little more expanded. And yeah. I think maybe what could be fun is the idea that Inquisitors come around and he has to fight one and eventually have to kill them off, because if he fights someone, that quiz is going to, and they escape, that quiz is like, I found Obi-Wan Kenobi. I found yeah. him, you know, because Vader wants to find him. Like, he's been on this hunt until, uh, you know, a, a new hope eventually comes about. So well, there's also, this- in, in, this, in the original trilogy, there's also the sense that, you know, everyone thought he was dead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everyone thought he was dead. So we'll see what happens. Um, but we we kind of talked about that quite a bit. So let's move forward here, guys. What's some... Let's have someone else kind of bring up a, a, one of the shows they're excited for, and we'll kind of talk in depth about it, too. Uh, Ryan, what about you? Out of all the ones, movies or otherwise? I mean, I have this list of nine of them, That's um, and we've talked about the first two, The Acolyte and Obi-Wan Kenobi, and uh, if we're going in, like, chronological order, the next one would be Andor. Now, James already said that he's excited for Andor. For me, that's another one, and I'm like, really? Do we really need to cover that much? I'm excited and- for the era, not for the character. Okay. Um, I, I have no feelings on it whatsoever. Who could, <laughs> you know? I think I like the idea of Andor because we always thought about what he brought up in Rogue One was a very interesting point, and I think it's going to be explored here, obviously, is that when we view the rebels, we kind of view them as these good guys who are fighting for justice and this, but we don't realize that they do some dirty and grimy stuff too. To make, they make bad choices. That was shown in the very beginning of Rogue One where he shoots that guy in yeah, the back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's so fairly think, merciless, and how did he get to this point? Um, like, obviously, like they again, yeah, they establish that he is not a fully moral character, and he's willing to do some terrible things. And I think it would be interesting to see a series either of his progression or like, because obviously, it's, <laughs> this isn't going to take place after Rogue One. Um, so, like, 
seeing him progress to that point would be kind of fascinating, I think. Because they even because he even said, I've done some horrible things to, for, for the rebelling. So we're obviously going to see these things that the rebellion does that may not be as kosher as some people would like, but it's the reality yeah. of it. You know what I mean? So that's, that's going to be kind of fun to explore. All right, so moving on here, if we're going chronologically, what's next, James? We spent like we spent like twenty minutes on all the other ones. We were like, oh. sorry, but it's I mean, because there's not there's I mean for for Andor's show, I mean, we kind of know what we're gonna get essentially. You know what I mean? Like yeah. we're gonna get some adventures with the rebellion. I mean, we there's also not see- as much weight to Andor as there is with Obi Wan, Ahsoka, um, right? Rogue Squadron, um, uh, one of the ones. I don't know if anyone else is interested in this one, but um, I'm going to say it. I'm super excited for a droid story because I'm not. R2-D2 <laughs> is my favorite character. And let's go ahead and talk this, about a droid story. Like, let's, as much as this like, series so, was hated, I feel like this is going to be a pre, uh, a sequel in spirit to droids, which if now, they people say aren't familiar... A, you mean the shitty uh, cartoon from the 80s? Whoa. Hey, watch your mouth, boy. That was not a shitty series. That was a brilliant series with a slamming soundtrack. I fucking love that series. That's why I, I love Star Wars because it was actually my entry into Star Wars. No, hold on. The reason uh, today why R2 is my favorite character. You may know more about this, James, but is this going to be just mini shorts or is this going to be a full on animated series? I don't know it's, no, it's, what it's, the it's extent a movie. of it is. It's a movie. Oh, it's a movie. Oh, okay. it's a movie. No, it's a made for uh, TV my thing on Disney series. Plus. Say what? Yeah, my thing says it's series. The series will introduce us to a new hero guided by legendary duo R two D two and C three PO. Well, then we've heard different things, but either way, <laughs> yeah. Um, I like I I kind of I like the fact the idea that Anthony Daniels has never been out of work with Star Wars. He did the original trilogy in the eighties. He did droids. He came back for the prequels. He came back for the sequels. He was in Rogue One. He's been in Clone Wars. He's probably been in Rebels at this point. Uh, he's doing this. He um, he he narrated the Star Tours thing, and he uh, he's appeared on the Oscars as C three PO. This guy has made a living out of this role. He might ha- he might hold the record for the like the longest and the most hours uh, clock in a role ever. And rest in peace, my boy Kenny Baker. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm excited for this, even if it's just you know it, voice acting and like it's going to be like goofy and silly but i don't care because i love the original droids um and i'm excited for this one even if no one else is so <laughs> i mean it could be cute it could be fun so i mean i'm not uh, totally against it um, it's r2d2 one thing, one thing that's we all are, i care um, about one thing we missed actually uh, before probably one that we're not talking about is i'm very excited for it i don't know how you are james and ryan you have no really knowledge of it but i'm kind of excited for the bat batch like not a lot of people yeah. liked it when they debuted on Clone Wars, but I thought they were awesome and badass. I don't know, James, are you excited for it at all? I mean, I'm trying to... I don't know if this is going to be the Bad Batch during the Clone Wars era. Um, I think it's supposed to be post-Clone Wars era, which is it going is. to be interesting to me because this is post-Order 66 then, which means that they're either... like I don't, Are they Imperial? Are they anti-Imperial? Because these are supposed to be like... Bro, renegades. Essentially. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Like that will be interesting. I don't know which way it's going to go. If they are anti empire, then I'm might be a little more interested. But yeah. Um, I mean, I did the trailer reaction for it. And by the way, guys, keep a lookout for that. I'm gonna be editing those this week. So keep a lookout <laughs> for all my trailer reactions. Did to you ever do the trailer reaction for the Marvel shows? Because I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts. I did as I did. I did. Okay. I'll, we'll talk about that off sure that's coming out. We'll talk about that's coming out. They're all coming out. Don't worry. But no, I did the trailer action and this takes place <laughs> in the trailer. It talks about the Order 66 happened and there it seems they're still working for the Empire, but they don't answer the question whether they had chips in their head either. Hmm. You know I mean they they don't they don't they don't flat out say that or not. So it'd be interesting to see because these things are these you know the Bad Batch are supposed to be, you know, uh, but how it seems people who are like before clones who are experiments that went wrong then they just put them in their own little squadron and that's so been my question is like who post um order 66 um is still under control of the empire like is rex the only one who's not um kind of deal well, so we we well me and you know the answer to that because of rebels oh did but, i miss something in rebels it's not were, just were there other ones it's not just rex I've no, got to watch the series again. I'm missing yeah. something. I forgot something. 
But anyway, um, so it's going to be interesting. Just because it's going to be interesting to see because you see because um, um, Grandma Tarkin uh, has a little cameo there in the trailer, so he's going to be a part of that as well. So um, it's going to be. I, get away of, from him. I'm just kind of excited <laughs> again. Like in the Andor area, we're kind of getting that post sixty uh, order sixty six time frame with these different characters. Yeah. A lot of people were excited for it because they just weren't, you know, they're kind of lukewarm on the Bad Batch in general. I thought they were awesome, like badass and different. So it's kind of good to just kind of dive into those characters. So I love anything in the era where, and this is one of the things that really bugged me about Revenge of the Sith is that they cut out all of this great backstory about the rebellion and how it actually kind of started from a bunch of senators who were not so kosher with what was going on in the war. Um, and like all, all of those characters minus Padme became leaders in the rebellion um, later on. And it's like, all like, that's one of the reasons I love Rogue One is because it's about that era of leading up to the rebellion as we know it in the film. So like anything in that era, I'm just hungry for because I just think yeah. that's like the empire is one of the most fascinating periods of time, I think. I think you know the struggle of the of the rebels against the empire and just trying to build that force and all of the other different like factions and the fallout of the you know there's no more Jedi and the Republic is gone and now there's this like giant military force that's just taking everything by storm and um, yeah. like even something like a bounty hunter show during that era because we know the bounty hunters became you know a huge resource during that period yeah. Um, Sure. I, I would that, that I think that would be a fun one to explore because they haven't announced all of the series. They said that there's ten series, but like there's ones they haven't announced yet. I'm mm-hmm. telling you guys, I feel like that tenth one's going to be Grogu and, and Luke Skywalker and the, <laughs> um, the, um, they're not they can't the Jedi the effects. They can't pull off the effects for Star Wars. Just get Sebastian Stan. Spoilers for <laughs> spoilers for season two, guys. Okay. Yes, heavy spoilers, guys. I apologize. <laughs> Well, but, uh, moving, on, moving on to our next one. It would, well, let's just go ahead and get Visions out of the way because I don't think we have anything to say about this. Visions, I think, is just going to be an anthology series of animated shorts. Yeah. Shit from across the Star Wars galaxy. Which I think is kind of kind of cool because I heard it's actually going to be like anime directors. And I think that one of the unsung sort of aspects of filmmaking has been animation, especially out of Japan. I think Japan does some incredible animation work. Um and I would really like to see that applied to some American franchises like they did with the Animatrix and now they're doing with Star Wars. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm not super excited for this, but I think the prospect of it is kind of fascinating. Yeah. Uh, So even in this time frame where, I mean, uh, we're getting Lando. So let's start on Lando because I have nothing to say about Vision. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have to say, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I, I'm excited. I mean, it looks like they're going to go, they're kind of going to go everywhere in the timeline as far as visions go. So it's kind of going to be just be an amalgamation within the time, within the entire timeline. But um, I want to kind of, what you guys, your guys' thoughts are on Lando. Because I, I love Donald Glover. I love everything it does. I feel like he definitely, like you said, you he haven't seen Community. Stuff. You haven't seen Community. That's what me and James are like all about. So, you know, <laughs> that's like his but, main <laughs> But um, I want to see with you guys having much more love. Like I said I do like the stuff I've seen him do, but I don't have that kind of same that same experience because I haven't seen Community. But what are your guys' thoughts? And have they confirmed if Lando is going to be during this time frame when he's young, or is it going to oh. be post Return of the Jedi? We they haven't confirmed that. anything. I don't think they haven't confirmed that Donald Glover is going to be in it, which you would think would be like right away, right? Like if they're going to have Donald Glover. I mean, are they really going to bring back Billy D? Like he was so tired in um, in uh, Rise of Skywalker. I don't think he's going to carry a series. I think you almost have to have it. Um, yeah, young Lando. I I mean I would love to see. I mean, Donald Glover I think is a comedic genius playing Troy Barnes in Community. I, I mean he did a good job in Solo. I don't again. I hate I hate for my my attitude towards a lot of this to be like really bad really bad but when you have ten series it's sort of like they're just, they're just mining all these uh, areas um, and I could you know that's that's the thing I could be wrong there there could be tremendous storytelling potential in any one of these veins of the Star Wars universe uh, there could be tremendous storytelling potential anywhere but like with Lando. <laughs> Um, I mean, he's a scoundrel, he's a smuggler, he's a gambler. There's, there could be tons of stories to tell about that. His time with the Millennium Falcon. I've read the books on Lando Calrissian, which um, 
you know, uh, Lando from the EU, the Lando Calrissian and the Flame Wind of Ocean and all that sort of stuff. So, well, could- there, there's there they name drop. Um, I'm trying to remember the line, but Return Return of the Jedi. They actually name drop that he was um, Battle of Tanab. Battle of Tanab. Yeah. Um, I'd be fascinated if it was about that. Mm-hmm. Like that showing that kind of like that was that was part of the impetus for Solo was that you know we're we're getting to see how he meets Lando, how he meets um, Chewie, how he gets the Falcon, him doing the Kessel Run, which was not what we expected it to be. Um, In less than five yeah. parsecs. <laughs> <laughs> well, according um, to Ray, it was twelve, but you know. <laughs> I love the I love the idea that Star Wars is filled with all these. Um, references that the expanding universe has tried to sort of explain before about you know every time they make a reference to something that happened it's like uh well someone must told them about my experience with battle of tanab um there's there's a there's a ref- there's a whole thing in the eu about that there's um uh in episode two i haven't felt you this tense since since we fell into that nest of gun docks you fell into that me- me- that mess master and i rescued you well there's a whole a uh, book about that. There's Even you saying that. that line is just so cringy. It's just <laughs> the dialogue is so bad. Sorry. And there's a there's a line about um um the the battle of uh, what's the thing in episode three where it's like uh, you missed the report on the on the siege of whatever and there's a oh there's a whole never mind I'm getting off on a tangent here but yeah there's yeah anyway <laughs> it could be good yeah they can take any line and make a book out of it yeah. Um, I think what they're trying to do is take those lines and make movies and shows out of it. Yeah, and I'm yeah. kind of all about that because some of the backstory and this stuff is stuff that I, I wanted to see how, you know, Han, you know, did the Kessel run in less than 12 bar sucks in less than whatever. Um, yeah. And like how, you know, <laughs> what Lando did at Tanab and all these other things. And, um, I don't know. I'm willing to see any of these. I'm willing to give any of them a chance because A, it's Star Wars, and B, I think under um, some of the talent that they've announced here, I, I, I'm kind of fascinated. One of the other ones that we haven't mentioned that I'm kind of excited for is the Untitled Taika YTT film. Yes. Yeah. We can go Simply to that because next. it's Taika YTT and <sighs> everything he seems to touch is gold right now. Um, you know, can- I I'm one of the like, few people. He's, he's the only one who made a worthwhile Thor film, and that includes Joss Whedon. How dare you? Sir? He he hates he hates because Joss because Joss Whedon what, did like an uncredited rewrite in the Dark World. Is that all you're talking about? No, or no, you... because I don't think Thor was very good in any of the Avengers films. I think his best outing That's true. was That's um, one of the, one of the, the third Thor part. film. Yeah. No, I I you see when we first did our initial re- uh, review, Josh and I back in seventeen of Thor Ragnarok, I ripped it to shreds and then we lost the footage. Hated it. And we never got to put that online, which is probably good because I would have received a shit ton of hate. Uh, (laughs) But uh, watching it again, I'm more merciful towards it. I I like it a a bit more, but I still think it was, they they went too hard right from the beginning towards comedy, which was too hard of a jump to me. But at any rate, um, I I haven't seen anything else the guy's done. Um, He seems like a nice guy. He was on Mandalorian. Well, yeah, he directed the man. He directed the season season finale of the Mandalorian, which was good. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I just I just hope it's not like a complete joke fest like Ragnarok. To me, Ragnarok just kind of went like, okay, let's. And I think I the reason know. why I think the reason why he's going to get his own show is because he did so well in the season finale of season one of the Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is the reason why I feel like he's getting his own movie. Which is let's let's go into speculation world here. What. What is it going to be? Is it going to, we're going to go old? What would be a perfect? We don't fucking know. Like, <laughs> I know we don't point? know, but, but we don't know, but I, I find it fun to kind of go into the speculation world. It's like, be what kind of anything? Like, it guys, could... we're missing the obvious answer here. It's clearly IG 11's backstory. <laughs> it could be, it could be Bosk's backstory. It could be freaking, uh, it, it's probably just like a, I don't know. It's, it, <laughs> I, it doesn't matter what he does. I think he's going to do well because, um, mm-hmm. like, I, I agree that Thor the Dark World or Thor um, Ragnarok was very jokey. I don't have a problem with that. I love humor. I love humor as a sort of. I think humor is very important to storytelling in, um, especially kind of as a as a means of um, 
I don't want to say release, but um, it, there's a catharsis to humor. And I think that it works very well in a lot of these very emotionally troubling sort of stories. Like you strip away the humor in Thor Ragnarok and it's a depressing damn movie. Like there's a lot of heartbreak and a lot of like his entire culture is destroyed. His father is dead. His brother, you know, is supposed to be dead. But like, there's a lot that's just terror. Like his, he's fighting his sister during this entire thing. Like he essentially loses. Mm -hmm. And it's like, without the humor, I think this is a very bleak film. I and I think the humor kind of, you know, builds it up a little bit. Well, um, I just wish the guy could take one fucking second seriously of his life. Like, just like you <laughs> see an interview with him. He's like, hey, Taika Waititi, how you doing? He's like, oh, how are, we any, how are any of us doing? You know, how, like, I'm just, okay with that. Fuck up and answer the question. You know, I'm like, you okay wonder if this, <laughs> I don't know, like, uh, uh, he actually answered a couple of my, um, my questions on Twitter. I've made two oh, nice. he replied to. One was, because I'm a huge, you guys know I'm a huge film score nerd. Um, so when they announced that Mark Mothersbaugh was doing the score, I didn't know what the movie was going to be like. I didn't know that it was perfectly appropriate. This is the guy who's the front guy, front man of Devo who did the score for... Did um, he do the score for Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs? I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay, did. that's why I know his name then. So Because that he's soundtrack the front, is popular. He's, he's the front man for Devo, so I said, that's such a crazy choice. Well, how did you choose him I mean, for this movie? Danny Elfman was... Um, what Oingo was his Boingo. band? Oingo Boingo. So. And so literally... His his um his response was found him on Craigslist. Like, yeah, it only fueled my rage. Like I was like, just fucking answer the question. Um, That's great. But he also answered my question. Um, I think I tweeted him about five thousand times because I was I always want to know who's doing the crew. I always want to know who's the director of photography, who's the editor, who's the production designer. I'm like James knows this. James is talking about how my mind just works on these lists and stuff. And I said, like, you're your, walking IMDb, my friend. I know, but like, yeah. who's, your, who's your DP? Who's your DP? Who's your DP? And like, finally, he just answered, and he was totally serious. Javier Aguirre Robe is our DP. And that was it. <laughs> but I got the answer. <laughs> and I knew ages before it was on IMDb who the DP on Thor Ragnarok was. Thank you very much. But yeah. yeah. To be fair, he might not be able to answer some of those questions sometimes because of contract negotiations and the way some of the behind the scenes deals kind of work. You can't mm -hmm. always tell people what you're working on True. or who you're hiring, um, especially because, you know, people fall through all the time <clears throat> and um, like companies are very protective, especially Disney of making these kinds of announcements. And if that stuff kind of leaks, he can get in big trouble for it. Um, so I can see why he would like, it took you 5,000 attempts to, um, you know, get him to tell you, well, Twitter's uh, a big place, too. I mean, I was, I was honored that I had two tweets. Not just one, but two tweets. <laughs> the guy. But I'm just saying, like, I wish you would take something seriously every now and then. That only, the, the answer to the... To so, the and that's, that's what I'm saying about um, Thor Ragnarok, is I think he does take things seriously. But like a lot of comedians do, you cover your pain with humor, um, which is yeah. a very classic comedian kind of thing. So I think that he, that's what he does in his style, is he's covering up the pain with humor. Um, and like even in the Mandalorian, there were jokes. Like one of my absolute favorite lines from the first season of Mandalorian was um, Apollo Creed sitting to the puppet and saying, "Do the hand thing, baby. Do yeah, the hand thing." Baby and the, kinda... the baby just waves at him like, "I have no idea what's going on, but he's waving at me." <laughs> and just that gif of him waving that was like, funny. Every time I talk to a friend of mine and we say hi, I respond with a baby Yoda gif of "Hi." Don't know what's going on, but hi, I'm adorable. But so I think literally... that's a perfect. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say. So literally, we have no idea what Taika Waititi is doing. We have no <laughs> idea what to talk about. We're just sh shooting the shit about Taika Waititi as a as a director and as a writer, and 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 the fact that he just you know he's 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 a constant joke. But I, I'm all about this project just because he's attached to it, like and an Oscar winner. Yeah. He's an Oscar winner. Yeah. Now, so. True. Speaking of you know stories that are unknown to us right now, we kind of stay here, but let's talk about the other side of the corner that I feel like a lot of us at least for me, if not looking forward to now is because of what happened with last Friday. But I've did my research and Ryan Johnson's movie trilogy is still on the books. Is it really though? It is though. He went to Twitter and saying that he's still signed I'm on Twitter to Twitter right the fuck now. He is still signed on to, um, for his three movies that are going to uh, talk about a uh, new characters from a corner of the galaxy that, uh, in star Wars lore that we have never explored before. 
So I'm, with, I'm okay with that because I'm not. Uh, I'm, I guess all, the guy I'm, needs to learn how to fucking spell Ryan. Okay. After that, <laughs> I, I I like um, the Last Jedi. I don't think it's a perfect film, but I think that he 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 asks some very interesting questions about the Jedi, about Luke's character, about um, you know the nature of the Force and Ray's path and all that stuff. Again, my problem with the sequels is that there's not enough of a cohesive through line in terms of character and story. But I think his entry was a fascinating one. And I think it was interesting within the scope of Star Wars because it challenged a lot of ideas that um, I think are fair to challenge. And for him to go off and do more, I'm kind of interested to see that. May not be for everybody. I'm okay with that. I liked his entry. I'm going to go see them. So I'm excited to see more because I feel like he left a lot of things unanswered. I mean, my experience with Ryan Johnson is this. I don't really blame him for The Last Jedi. Like, I I consider the sequel trilogy to be the the worst thing that's ever happened to the human race. Um, (laughs) With a few exceptions, you know, like, um, but uh, um, I mean, if your homework assignment was to make, I mean, if you're coming off The Force Awakens and you guys know that my, the central conceit of my hatred for those movies is this, the plot thread that J.J. Abrams introduced in The Force Awakens. There's no more Jedi, Luke didn't do what he was supposed to do, whatever. Okay, if your homework assignment is to make a movie continuing that storyline, then fine. He did as good a job as just about anyone. Um, concerning his other movies, uh, Knives Out was pretty good. Sure. Um, I, mean, I love that movie, yeah. Looper, I mean, J- Josh and I were debating this. I was like, I was like, Looper, really? And Josh was like, yeah, Looper. And I was like, really? And he's like, yeah. Awesome movie. Like, it's not, though. It sucks. <laughs> so we See, here's why, I'm not, here's why I'm not excited. Because yes, yes, he's creating a whole new... See, that's, I guess... Here's what I'm getting at. He is good when he has his own original content that he's creating, like Knives Out, like Looper. He is great when he has his own ideas. So maybe it may be better, but just for me, after I saw the last journey, even when I first left here, I'm just kind of scratching my head like, okay. Like there's a lot of, like the whole Cantabite scene was just the worst scene in the history of Star Wars movies I think I've ever seen in my life. Was the what scene? The scene where they go to that the, the Cantabite planet where they go to try and find this 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 guy yeah. that they need to find where Benito del Toro's there and it's just and how that all transpired was just the stupidest thing ever. I seen. feel like that was forced on him though because it doesn't really fit with the narrative or spirit of the rest of the film. The only part of it that actually works is Rose's line, and it's a shame because Rose's character was not a terrible character. It just she didn't fit within everything else that was going on, and yeah, then yeah. they just dropped her. Um, but yes, the candle bite scene was awful. Um, but regardless, of, I mean, it's just, I feel like he does better when he has his own content. So maybe it will be good. I don't know. Cause knives out really, I just, uh, me and my wife love that film. Uh, so we'll see. I just, I still have a sour taste in my mouth because last year, there's only a few things I like about it. Like I love the training aspect that Ray goes through. I mean, it does have that interesting question of what happens to a man in his hubris after he fails trying to restore the Jedi Order and his own nephew turns the dark side, what happens to a man that does that? Or a person? Like, what does a person do with that? And I feel like that was a very interesting avenue to take, even though I would prefer something else like me and Ryan would. But we're going to digress on that one. That is still an interesting character study question to answer. And I feel like that was the one avenue you could take. And it wasn't horrible. I just feel like how he died was the stupidest thing too, Mm -hmm. obviously. Um, But you know, and probably for me, one of the best, it's funny, it has one of the worst scenes, and for me, one of the best visual scenes in Star Wars is the throne scene where the the um, Kylo Ren and Rey are fighting the guards. That to that me was, was cool very, scene. that was very samurai-esque, like, wide shot scene. It was very beautiful. So, but, I don't know, we'll just, we'll see what he has in store. I just, I'm, like I said, I still have a sour taste in my mouth from it. See, I, I'm going to disagree because I liked Luke's death. I liked, um, all of like the confrontation scene between him and Kylo. That was great. Um, but I mean, that, all of that, I love, like, I love that um, he basically went out the way Obi-Wan and Yoda did where they kind of gave themselves to the force and like dematerialized and just vapor, like just dis- like he's so exhausted from like <laughs> the idea of doing a battle entirely with a projection on another yeah. planet, in another galaxy, like just that is a force power unto its like that is just 
mastery level of the force right it shows how far this character has come as a person as a you know force user but also as like on his journey of uh, like he no longer looks that disheveled he looks sort of similar to what he used to look like you know he's got the shorter cropped hair he's in the dark outfit again um as opposed to like the white robes that are sort of like greasy and tainted and whatnot um he like he looks like he's back to his mastery form um and he's absolutely fearless and absolutely badass and i feel like this is the ultimate this is the pinnacle of luke's journey um and that may not work for everybody i'm fine with that not working for everybody but i like if this is the story they're telling i like that being the ending of the story they're telling where luke has accepted that you know this isn't fully on me the Jedi don't necessarily need to exist. The Force is going to exist with or without the Jedi. Um, and most importantly, I need to buy my friends time. Yeah. And this is entirely about getting them the ability to get out of here so that they can continue to fight this fight because they're in a dire situation. You know, they've got no worlds to run. Um, and just like... Him, like, oh, that fight scene just to me, it's absolutely one of the best fight scenes. It's not a fight scene, it's, he's not yes, even it is. There, and it's, so... it's still a fight scene, whether they, they make contact or not. It's still a fight scene, it's an emotional fight scene. Like, it's so well done. It's so, in, like, oh, I love that so much. Like, right. folks, we we were. <laughs> We can't devolve into a debate about The Last Jedi. Believe me, we could do a, a whole thing. We could do it all day. Yeah, we can well, do it all day. Yeah. And real quick, though, before let's let's move forward. I feel like it's we'll see what Ryan Johnson does this trilogy, and let's just hope for the best. That's all we can do. Ryan Johnson uh, next up is doing a sequel to Knives Out. I know that. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so He's who knows what the trilogy's even going to start, honestly? Um, yeah. But before we move on to the before we move on to the rest of the the post Return of the Jedi content that Star Wars is producing, I just want to give a huge little quick talk about some of the other books that are coming out that I'm kind of excited for. Um, they're on uh, in April 27th uh, around my birthday. They're going to finally finish out the Thrawn book trilogy series. The that uh, is actually going to you know, cover up, uh, finish out, I believe, his trilogy books, which takes place uh, during the uh, Rebels time frame uh, after Order 66 and before A New Hope. So I'm I'm just kind of curious to see how that's going to all transpire. And then of course you have some of the High Republic, uh, rest of the High Republic things that are coming out, and then they have confirmed also that they're going to be doing a Mandalorian book that they haven't talked much about that's going to be coming out on November 2nd. I don't know if it's going to give more meat to the bone going into season three or not, but we will see that they, they did announce that there will be a Mandalorian book coming out November 2nd. So that out of the way, guys, let's now go on to some of the post Return of the Jedi content. Mandalorian, I'm, I'm just calling it the Mandalorian time frame. Mandalorian uh, spinoffs, yep. Yeah, first one so, you guys are gonna have a field day with is Ahsoka. Again, oh God, yes. We ha I have I I saw the Clone Wars movies movie the Clone Wars movie in theaters. That's my extent. I saw. <laughs> no, the first don't, don't go with that, man. Oh, no. yeah. um, that I, film does not do justice to like Ahsoka. I didn't even finish Clone Wars, and I know just how good the last two seasons were. So, oh, hey, season sky seven guy. Was spectacular. Like, like Ahsoka to me is this annoying character. Is like, hey, sky guy. Why don't you lighten up a bit? Like I'm. Oh, uh, she is. She is probably my new favorite character. Like because of Rebels, because of Clone Wars, and because of, like I haven't read her book yet, but I've heard some high praise about it. I want to read her book. That's considered canon, but I, she's now probably my new favorite character. That just I love. She's one of the story. few characters we get that much sort of character development for. Yeah. Because we don't really follow many characters from childhood to like I mean Vader kind of, but. Vader almost becomes a completely different character partway through his journey, um, whereas Ahsoka is almost consistently Ahsoka. Yeah. Um, and, it's like, again, the trauma of, you know, what happened to her with all of her friends being massacred and, um, you know, having to live through the end of the Republic era and into the Empire and, you know, watching her mentor fall to the dark side. And um, yep. I said it in the Mandalorian um, review. I don't think this is spoilers for anybody, but I really want to. I really want to see in this series her and Luke have just even one scene, that so that great. Luke can tell her that, that like Anakin was redeemed. You know what else would be very fun? So you know, Hayden Christensen is coming back for the Obi Wan series. 
why not have him come back in the Soka series as a Force Ghost? I would love that. Just give him, just give her some closure on that, please. Yeah, because because um, I feel like it's. Seen, but maybe she has a scene with Darth Vader in the Obi Wan Kenobi series. Who knows? Who knows? Like, but yeah, like give her some closure with the. <laughs> well, you know, Ghost. there's there's some stuff there that will be me and James. I want to spoil for you for Rebels, <laughs> but it's it, it just so talking about Soka. There's actually going to be some spoilers for people who have not seen Rebels. So we're also going to be a little bit vague for Ryan, but I feel like it's <laughs> obvious. It's obvious that her, because of what happened in The Mandalorian, that she is searching for Thrawn, for Grand Animal Thrawn. Yep. And if you guys know how Rebels ended, um, it has to include, obviously, Ezra Bridger, because of how things concluded in Rebels, if she's looking for him, it's probably because she's looking for Ezra the most. And so what then makes a, what makes a fun thing is, um, it, you would think, James, you would have to assume that they're going to bring in a character, someone to play Sabine. You, I mean, I, I, I was hoping they would do that during um, Mandalorian because I actually guys. thought the second, um, right? Me too. W- when they brought in Bo Katan, I actually thought the other one was going to be Sabine, um, mm-hmm. even though they they wouldn't be like. <laughs> there's history there, but, um, but given given the, I mean, because Dave Filoni did say the epilogue of Rebels, he does not distinctly say when that takes place. Yeah. So we could we it, this could be a scenario where she gets that information of where Thrawn sort of is from that woman, and then that epilogue is seen as the gap afterwards. Yeah. We don't know. So uh, I mean, it could be it could be very exciting, and who knows how long the season can go about because that's kind of a short story of of our journey of to find uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn. But I mean, there should there also could be. That could be like the first season and the aftermath is what happens in the aftermath with either Ezra or Thrawn. You know what I mean? And that's, that's an, speaking of Thrawn, I think that's actually going to be another interesting aspect of this, not just having Thrawn in here, but um, again, we mentioned it in the Mandalorian review, but I think that Ahsoka's story is also going to be Thrawn's story to a degree. Yeah, because, I believe so too. Um, e- even though we've had him in Rebels, we've never had him in live action and people have been like chomping at the bit to get this character in Star Wars, like official Star Wars canon since the Thrawn trilogy. People have wanted a Thrawn trilogy movie series mm-hmm. since the books dropped. Um, and I think that this is going to be sort of partially his story and they're going to start like maybe borrowing some aspects of the Thrawn trilogy. Um, obviously because, you know, this is this is his era because this is post Jet, uh, post-Empire Return of the Jedi um, era. Like so post and Post Empire, post Return of the Jedi, sorry, yeah, era um, where in the Thrawn trilogy, this was when he was ruling, when he was trying to, you know, reunite all of the different factions of the Empire mm-hmm. to, you know, return fire on the New Republic that was building and on what he still deemed as rebels and whatnot. Um, he was the major driving force between behind, you know, the Empire becoming sort of a faction again that could be viable and i think that seeing some of that might be actually kind of this is right smack dab in that era so like why wouldn't they do that if they're going to introduce them why not build that aspect of the character and i think that's kind of going to be fascinating it's obviously like it's named ahsoka so it's obviously going to be mostly her but yeah how do you introduce thrawn without tackling some of that subject matter that's true because and also this could go either way like because there's two different scenarios here we have uh, i think i feel like the only two scenarios we have on the plate as far as where this could go with, with Thrawn in particular. It's either A, he's the guy who kind of, like you said, is trying to bring all the factions of the Empire, the fractured Empire, and bring them back together. And he eventually is the catalyst of the First Order. Or he does it even further in the background. He's actually in, on Exegol trying to bring back Darth Sidious. And that's where they eventually find, that's where Ahsoka eventually finds him and Ezra and there's like a big confrontation and she eventually kills him or whoever does Ezra I don't know who we don't know because it's obvious he's not in the sequel trilogy otherwise they wouldn't be bringing this thread in he had to I would assume if they're kind of going with timeline there they would have to kill him off in a fashion in between uh, before the force awakens so we I, what do you think? yeah I think that's a safe assumption I mean especially because it's no longer the empire it's now um, the first order, yeah. The first order, it's completely changed. It's a new thing. 
Um, and I don't think Thrawn would be down with that. I think he would, he, he's trying to restore the empire. So I yeah. think that him starting that journey that we saw in rise of Skywalker, yes, where, you know, they're trying to, and parts of, again, going back to the Thrawn trilogy and the EU where they are trying to resurrect Palpatine. Um, I do like we're, we're, we're seeing seeds of what we are guessing is that in um, Mandalorian with, you know, the, the, the biological experiments on baby Yoda and um, the implied use of like, they're doing something with this force sensitive character. I think that the most reasonable conclusion is either force clones, which I think would be a huge waste or yes, they're trying to resurrect Palpatine. Or, um, or, or it's Palpatine in the background. He's already alive, and he's there trying to create Snook. It's one of because they because well, they, 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 they kind of they kind of alluded Snoke that is... they kind of alluded that Palpatine is he was using Snook as his puppet, like he yeah. was the face of it all, where he was yeah. in the background. So, I, yeah, that's why I don't think it'll be Snook. I think Snook is just supposed to be. Uh, Snook is a big waste of a character, to be honest. He is. He really is. But um, you guys like this. That's actually the one thing I enjoyed about not enjoy. That's too strong a word. <laughs> that's actually the one thing that I um, thought was a halfway decent decision because to me, Snoke was the worst character ever created in the sequel trilogy. Like literally, not only do you have another Skywalker falling to the dark side uh, and putting on a helmet and literally becoming Darth Vader. But you have another albino scarred guy sitting in a chair behind the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I won't argue so, with you about Snoke. Snoke of, was a big waste of, the, of a character. Uh, so one of the best ideas of the sequel trilogy was for in Rise of Skywalker for J.J. Abrams to say, yeah, that was just Palpatine. Because it was just Palpatine. Yeah, no. <laughs> and that, even though I think the Palpatine twist in that was garbage and forced. came absolutely out of nowhere, it was forced. I think it's, it's a better resolution than... Snoke is a character, and that's why I yeah. would rather see them developing Palpatine. And Snoke is just a yeah. byproduct of what they're trying to do. Like maybe he's the failed experiment of trying to create Palpatine. Now, here's the only reason I believe it's Snoke, and we were going off on a tangent here, but we're kind of we're still in the realm of Ahsoka because of what might happen with Thrawn. But anyway, I, the reason I think it's Snoke is because when we're going to the when the Mandalorian, when they're going to these labs, sure. and they're seeing these these creatures or these these beings in these tubes. That's very reminiscent of what you saw in the opening scene of Rise of Skywalker, where you saw versions of Snoke in these liquid tubes. That's the only reason it makes me assume that it's going to be Snoke, and maybe it's Thrawn who's the head of this plan to try and bring Snoke to life, but he's following the orders of Palpatine. I think Snoke yeah. was a step along the way to creating the clone of Palpatine that shows up in the Rise of Skywalker. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. I, I'm I'm sticking with he was a failed experiment like <laughs> in creating Palpatine and yeah because like, again complete waste of a character yeah. don't develop him maybe if he shows up and say okay this is his origin so that we can kind of get this issued and out of the way but our purpose here is Palpatine is mm -hmm. you know rebuilding the empire and he is the emperor you don't have an empire without the emperor and so, yeah so let's let's go ahead and move forward and there's two ones we want to talk about because they're kind of related in in a, in a sense we have the rogue squadron directed by patty jenkins coming out 2013 2023 which is i am a very i think we're, me and james are both very excited about but also in the same time frame and it's also the same time as the mandalorian we're getting rangers of the new republic which i feel like they're going to kind of go i feel i feel like they're kind of go go in tandem with one another mm -hmm as far as in the in, in in regards to the new republic but what do you which one what do you guys think could be about you know what what, what could these could be about and i i you wondered if for? rangers was going to be a Cara dune spinoff not because i think Cara Dune's a good yeah. character or i think she's going to be interesting but i like the idea of her background as a sort of um shock soldier who, a shock trooper who you know they just drop into these bad zones and i thought you know, when I heard the title, I immediately thought of that. Like, wouldn't that be interesting to see yeah. maybe her training the next generation of that or her sort of like, you know, balking at that idea and um, maybe agreeing, like, because she, you know, she obviously has trauma from that because the Republic kind of like rebuffed her, even though she did all these things for the rebellion and whatnot. Um, and she has some, again, trauma related to all these things. Um, I think it would be interesting if it was her kind of agreeing to train, you know, a group of green sort of 
Shock Troop for the New Republic because she doesn't want the people that trained her or that betrayed her doing it. And she feels okay. like she could do it right. Um, unfortunately, yeah. I don't care for the actress very much. And what? I would really like to see someone who's a bit stronger as an actress um, kind uh, of take that role. But she charmed her way through that role. I think she's doing. Yeah, I thought I thought she did. Was I thought she did a good job as Cara Dune. And I would yeah. having you hear hearing you about that does sound like a good idea because if this takes place after Mandalorian season two, I mean, she just bring, she did just bring in Moff Gideon to the Republic, so she could yeah. be in line for a, a high promotion, uh, so to speak. But it, it either could be that, or Ryan was, you were talking about that this series is going to be possibly about those characters we saw in The Mandalorian with the X-Wing fighters. Sure, yeah. I mean, it could possibly, I would, I would actually like the idea of more Cara Dune. I'd really but. like that because the, 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 you guys might not know this, but the bearded dude, um, the, the, the Korean looking dude, is actually from a, he's from Toronto. Uh, <laughs> he's from a Canadian TV series called um, Kim's Convenience, which is about like a convenience store in Toronto where he's this old immigrant dad who is really not down with what's going on. And his kids are like modern and, you know, sort of like adjusted to Canadian life and he's not. And it's about their sort of like their conflict over that. And it's actually a really hmm. funny show. Um, really well done. A lot of like interesting cultural deep dives and whatnot. Um, but he's <laughs> he's a huge nerd. And what I absolutely love about him is he has a collection of proton packs. <laughs> Man, <laughs> we're proton to packs. <laughs> so oh my God, that's So I'm funny. all for him leading a series because this that guy is now my favorite man. We cannot go through a single episode, guys, without if we were. I didn't mention working. Ghostbusters. I mentioned proton packs. They're different things. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I mean that, and I think what also might be helpful is because I mean they haven't announced when this series is going to be coming out, but we do know for sure that um, that Patty Jenkins's movie is coming out in twenty twenty three. Because you're because tr- you're trying to think about in the in the realm of canon, is like is the rogue squadron going to set up the uh, you know the uh rangers of the republic or is it going to be vice versa so and because it, it are they be, even going to be necessarily related yeah we don't know because but they did say that they're going to try and interconnect these movies to their tv shows kind of like what marvel is going to be doing moving forward so it could be it could be either one because i know they're they are talking about how there's going to be quite a few battles against between the because uh, they did talk about in the force mix there's a huge battle between the empire and the new republic before the first order was essentially created yeah so this could be that yeah the sort of last battle it. on um what was her planet yeah is it jaku jaku yeah yeah so which so that, by the way some of my favorite visuals from the sequels is like all of these destroyed that was pretty cool um, i'm not gonna lie <laughs> yeah um so sorry let me, yeah let me Go just ahead. say this um did you guys hear her story when she made the little short intro yeah, like, that um, was pretty awesome. Her dad was a fighter pilot, and he mm-hmm. died in the line of duty. And like she said after that, like I want to make the world's best fighter pilot movie, and she could never find the right script for it. And then she then like she also was a huge Star Wars fan, and she's like, yep. someone came to her, he's like, oh, this is what I'm gonna do. And here's the thing about Patty Jenkins, she's a fucking awesome director. I mean, she's only like. She is. She made Monster like 18 years ago, or long. Like, Which is an outstanding film. Well, I've never seen it, but it's like literally she made it. Charlie Theron won an Oscar for it, and then she disappeared. And like, I, didn't I'll, I'll put it this way: she made a serial killer almost likable. Yeah, right. But, like, you almost relate to this character. And then she, she didn't come out for the Warner for like 15 years, and then she made Wonder Woman, and it was coming off the heels of Zack Snyder, who sucks. Sorry, for this, you know. But, uh, and and she made a couple <laughs> of movies. So I mean. She's just balls out awesome. She I'm is really a bit... looking forward to that movie, and I think she will make a great fighter pilot movie. You know, yeah, because uh, James, James, this has to be like since you love the dog fighting aspect of Star Wars, this has got to be like your wet dream, essentially, for oh, the, this type of film. It's like a, it's like Top Gun in space. So I'm I'm gonna say, um, hearing that she was looking for a dog fighting film, and like that's her purpose in this movie, to me makes it like a thousand times better and i'm already so hyped for this film because i love the rogues i love um you know just the dog fighting and the, like the just not even the dog, like the heroics of those characters and just like the amount of skill like 
one of the things I did enjoy about the sequels or that I do enjoy about the sequels, I, I, there's a lot, but it's watching Poe Dameron fly because he is an outstanding yeah. pilot and seeing outstanding pilots is like one of those things that I don't feel like we get to actually see a lot. Like we see Han do some crazy shit, but mm-hmm. that's not outstanding pilot. That's just crazy shit because Han is yeah. buck wild when it comes to flying, <laughs> but like getting to see the rogues actually doing like some of the maneuvers that they've come up with and, you know, some of the heroic runs that they've done. And I just, and I think we mentioned it before briefly that, you know, the end of Rogue One was all kinds of exciting to see what they can do with, you know, modern sort of effects mm-hmm. with dog fighting and all that. So knowing that she's into this for that reason, just. Excites me. Yeah. Excites you. I think, I think I'm as excited for that as I am for Ghostbusters Afterlife. The reason I think um, this could be exciting because I'm thinking about the story. Like, what kind of story could she tell? Since it's about, obviously, a squadron of people, what I think would be interesting if this takes place during the Mandalorian timeline is if what if they bring back Wedge as, like, the head of the squadron, but it's not focused on him. It's about maybe one of the characters within the squadron that he's sort of training well, along I, the way. Well, that, that was my thing. That was my idea was <laughs> – I've already kind of borrowed this for um, – the the other one the worry the thing of the new republic um but what if it's wedge training a new generation of yeah like he's recruiting pilots for us bras i don't think either one of you have actually read the rogue squadron series the the x-wing series by michael a stackpole but you i have not I really recommend it to both of you um but it's that's what it is it's it's literally about wedge being the commander of rogue squadron it's a humongously critically acclaimed well, I know what it's about, but they yeah. like are they they aren't necessarily going to use that as the impetus for this film. Know, I'm wondering what they this really... film is going to be. I feel like they're going to. I mean, I feel like they're going to because it would make the most sense. I, I don't I don't want it's not because he's not a bad actor. It's not because he's a good actor or a bad actor. It doesn't matter. I feel like if you're going to include Wedge, which you should, if you're going to stay within the lore, because right now in this timeline, he is like the best fighter pilot they have besides Luke Skywalker. Mm-hmm. You know, who's so, off doing his own thing now yeah who's off doing his own thing now so I, I, in my imagination he would be the commander of this squadron but it wouldn't focus on him like i said he would be more of like the guy you would see along the way of this of the character's journey of learning to become this fighter pilot now a lot of people like not a lot of people i had had one friend because i was talking i was speculating this with a friend like, oh what if it's poe dameron i'm like no poe is like an infant during this time frame yeah, yeah. a child poe is because like not in, even poe's like in his 30s so I don't even know if he's even if he's maybe just born like he's like a toddler. So that would not be the case, you know. So I'm just I'm I think this would be a perfect it's the perfect opportunity for Patty Jenkins, and we might just I think we're in store for something special. I think for with her. So yeah. so moving on, lastly, we'll we'll touch briefly on it before we move on to the last one. But um, because we talked about it, Mandalorian season two, and we're gonna try and not be as spoilers to ruin it for anybody uh, who hasn't seen the last of Mandalorian season two. But um, I'm excited for season three. Uh, it's coming out next year. Now, there was a lot of confusion online about um, because this and Boba Fett are scheduled to be coming out December of 2021. Mm-hmm. Now, there was a lot of confusion like, oh, well, is Boba Fett going to be the new Mandalorian season three? Or are they done with Din? That's not the case. It's been confirmed <laughs> that it's going to be his own spinoff. Boba Fett's going to have his own spinoff series. And season three of Mandalorian is coming out. And this one, I mean, not to get. I mean, I guess we're going to have to go into some spoilers here, folks, but if you don't want to hear, just kind of mute and move forward. But, I mean, I, like I said, we talked about before, I think it's going to rely heavily on Bo, uh, Din and Bo-Katan's journey of retaking Mandalore. And you're going to get snippets between there and then with uh, Grogu. But I think that's going to be the main journey. Now, do I think it's going to be like that first season and they're going to retake Mandalore? No, I feel like there's going to be a lot of more journeys along the way because Bo-Katan needs to I think it's going to be a lot of recruiting Mandalorians, like a lot of in, in adventures in between those time frames. Yeah, what did you like, guys call it? Quest, quest, fa- quest for. <laughs> um, quest fest, er, fest, quest. <laughs> I mean, because I can't even speak now. Um, yeah, quest fetching. <laughs> yes. Because regardless of what you think about it, though, James, the, that's what the Mandalorian show is. I mean, season one is was the epitome of that. I don't have a problem with fest quest. Yeah, it, yeah, but <laughs> I can't say the word. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like that's like like they're gonna go it's to a certain light, clan. Guys. But you know what I mean? Like they're gonna go to a certain clan to recruit them, but like, oh well, you want our help? Well then you're gonna you need to help us with this. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Maybe this that's is where we get some 
That's all what all the episodes are is literally the Mandalorian, like I said in our Mandalorian review, could have been three times shorter if they'd just gone from point A to point B. But instead it's if you want to go to point A, you have to go on this quest and this quest and this quest. But yeah. no, I mean so I don't I think- know if it's gonna be about Mandalore. I don't know that because he doesn't give a rat's ass about Mandalore. Like literally at the point where the end No, but now he is now stuck in a situation um due to events in Mandalorian where um, whether he likes it or not, he is going to be intertwined. So I don't know if it's going to be the entire season necessarily, but they are going to very clearly have to address um, the, the sort of burden that's been placed on him accidentally mm-hmm. and the the conflict that he is going to face due to that. And that doesn't make it- I'm realizing oh, that's and, making no sense to anyone who hasn't seen it. No, I'm yeah. trying to be as vague as possible without spoiling well, things. Well, if you haven't because... seen The Mandalorian season two, let me just say this. Luke Skywalker shows up. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, buddy. <laughs> but no, so, and by the way, guys, by the way, can we just nerd out about the fact that Katie Sackhoff has done a fantastic job as Bo-Katan, even though we only understand I didn't even episodes? recognize her. Oh, I did. When I saw it, I was like, because <laughs> she, vo- she voiced Bo-Katan in The Rebels. Oh, I didn't know and, that. And and in Clone Wars, she also she voiced her in Clone Wars and in Rebels. I'm fact so, checking. I have rewatched those, man. Yeah, and, and so it was kind of satisfying to see her actually don the Be armor the in real life. Yeah. yeah, and she just did such a badass, fantastic job. So I I, I feel like with a I don't know what, as, as a a prominent figure in the nerd community, I feel like you almost have to have her as like Din's new companion since Grogu is not there. That's why I feel like she's going to be there for this journey. Because it's going to still focus on Din no matter what. I mean, even in, even though Grogu has taken over the love of the fan, the fandom, it was still Din's story regardless throughout season one and two. Well, do you guys just, think, what's the deal now that people have seen his face? You see, I mean, he has to wear the helmet because that's like the show, like the poster of the show is his... You can't just... I mean, even, even, without, even without his oath, like, the helmet's just practical sense. Like you, you're a warrior fighting people in space. Right. The helmet, like it's just part of your armor. So, him wearing the helmet is going to continue. That's that's no one's like it's not just going to be him without the face now or with just the face now. And here's um, a little here's a little nerd fact for I mean for some Star Wars fans out there, and I don't know if you guys knew because I was wondering like watching this show, why out of like out of all the Mandalorians, why Din was the only one who like walks through bolt bolt fires. Like, why didn't the other Mandalorians, like Bo-Katan and the others, just, like, walk along through this, this fire firing squad, you know, of, of laser, laser bolts? And I learned that um, not all Mandalorian, like, okay, so all Mandalorian armor is made from Beskar, but it's Beskar plated underneath, yeah. uh, underneath a layer of metal, whereas Din's is pure, nothing but Beskar. So, like, yeah, he, they, he has, like, super suit that, armor. They, they explained that briefly in, in the first season where – a lot of this aren't like some of the older armor yes has that stuff but a lot of the armor was melted down by the empire in the mandalorian purge and turned into weaponry for them because it is such a great um source of armor source of you know weaponry but it also deflects um lightsaber blasts or yep. lightsaber um attacks which when you're hunting down the Jedi, that's kind of an important thing to do. So having that is invaluable to the Empire. Um, so I, a lot of, yeah, I can understand why a lot of their armor isn't necessarily that, whereas, you know, he just won this ice cream tub of literally an ice cream maker. <laughs> yeah. Um, you guys know that backstory, right? Yeah, yeah. we are, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure yeah. it's... But yeah, because I was wondering about that. I was like, well, why is Bo-Katan, you know, hiding from all these bolt, you know, blasts, but Din isn't? It's hers, hers like everybody else's in the Mandalore, they're Beskar plated. They're not necessarily pure Beskar like Din's is, where he's like a walking bulletproof vest, basically. It's probably also why Boba, Fett's, it, Boba Fett is so feared is because his armor is, you know, a throwback to that same time period of yeah. pre-Empire sort of um, armor. Uh, because mm-hmm. you know his it was his father's armor his father obviously got it from um when he was you know uh, anyway first anyway. of all josh anyway. you're right katie sackoff did voice bo i didn't trust yep. you i don't trust you oh. <laughs> ouch oh. ouch but anyway but we we're really talking about it briefly i think that's gonna be the overarching thing with mandolin 2 3 but let's move forward to the last thing we're gonna talk about because i feel like 
we, there could be so many characters that could come into this series and with this is Boba Fett's series. Now I have heard that this is not going to be a long, this is going to be a one season thing. And that's Oh, we it. don't know shit. Like why? I mean, <laughs> we, why? But I mean, from what I heard from, from the sources online is that this is going to be a season, a one season show kind of talking about, you know, and that's just his show. Could he pop up in other movies? We don't know yet, but who are you guys most excited to possibly see in Boba Fett show? And what, what's going to transpire, you think, in it? Like, I obviously, I feel like someone who has to make his, finally make his talking, I should say, talking on screen debut is, um, oh, God, I'm, I'm, I'm. Salacious Crumb. No, it's his, it's his bounty Bosk. hunter, Bosk, yes. Because we saw Bosk in Empire Strikes Back with his foot and his face, but we haven't seen him talk like we have in, like, Rebels or Clone Wars. So I feel like someone who's obviously going to have to probably show up is Bosk. I don't know. What do you guys... What about IG-88? What about... I would, like... There's a book called IG-88's Tales... dead. Is he dead? I don't know. They just... They just I have mean, one... okay, to be I fair, know. we don't know if Shadows of the Empire is actually canon anymore, but... <laughs> um, he, in the old canon, he was dispatched um, by Dash Rendar, so... Like... <laughs> but we all know Disney just fucked over all the legend- <laughs> legends. Uh, I don't have any feelings about that, but... Um, uh, no, I mean, they just had, it's, it's amazing. Like you said, Boba Fett is just that this character who just because he looked cool has had this huge fan following. Well, the same can be said for all those bounty hunters that just showed up on the bridge of the Star Destroyer, Bosk and IG-88 and the guy with the bandages on his head and the, and just whoever, you know, like. Dengar. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I think, I don't think that's the direction they're going to go because I think that the, they very specifically went through, if you don't know what we're talking about, go to the very end credits um, of the end of the last episode of Mandalorian and you see Boba Fett go back to Jabba's palace, butcher um, Bib Fortuna, who's put on some Fat. weight. <laughs> yeah, and basically sits on the throne that's left in Jabba's palace. And to me, that implies that he's going to become an underworld boss. And I think it's, yeah. I think it's going to be less bounty hunting and more about the sort of crime syndicates and going up against the huts who have traditionally been the ones who have sort of ruled the outer rim. Sure. Um, and to be fair, with the exception of the terrible clone wars movie, <laughs> um, we don't know much about the huts. The huts aren't very covered within the star Wars universe, mm -hmm. you know, outside of the one character that we've seen um, in it's like a... job of the hut. So I think that, I think the Stinky. underworld is something <laughs> It, it, it's an aspect of Star Wars we haven't seen before in live action, yep. and I think it would be kind of fun to explore that as him sort of staking his claim as sort of, you know, the new lord of this realm. True. And I don't think it's going to be about bounty hunters. I just feel like if you're going to have a Boba Fett series, why, you, you'd almost have to have Boss, because that was, that Boss was kind of the person who trained him, if you know a lot about the Clone Wars series and whatnot. It's kind of the guy who trained Guys, Boba leave Fett. me out again. Sorry. Like, watch the series, man. It's yeah, a good know, series. Right? But I mean, uh, you, because of you, I'm watching it. Community. Because of you, I'm already got like... <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, it, it's Wait almost... Wait you'd be satisfied. <laughs> Never. I feel like it's a foregone conclusion that you'd have to include Boss. And maybe his other left-hand person, because uh, what's her name is basically his her his right-hand woman. Mulan. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Brian, her name, Karen. please. Yes, I don't know if it's... <laughs> She's not... Kidding. Not when... <laughs> But, I mean, she's played by a great actress. Maybe not when she is, but I mean, she was great in Agents of Shield. But um, I digress. Uh, so we almost have to assume he's going to be in it, and so we'll see. Yeah, if he's going to, because after Jabba died, there's nothing really known about what happened to the rest of the huts, because it's obvious there's a, it's a whole kind of clan. It wasn't just Jabba the Hut. I mean, and even in its canon that he has a son. Well, so, if you wait, what? Well, Clone Wars movie is canon. <sighs> so it's, would you stop? <laughs> You guys keep bringing all this. No, um, there was no, actually... the Clone Wars. The Clone Wars movie that you yep. saw was Stinky. That's yep. Jabba's son. He is that canon. Was he is literally is canon. twelve years ago. That was literally <laughs> twelve years ago. I don't remember a damn thing from it, um, except for Ahsoka calling Anakin Sky Guy, which made me think she was the worst character ever, which apparently has been disproven <laughs> because she's so great. But um, uh, no, I yeah, sure, fine. She had a father know. in this. James, you might know this. There was a terrible series of youth of made for the youth books that came out after Return of the Jedi that was called the Glove of Darth Vader series, in which the rest I know of that one. You don't know that one? No, I don't know that one. The rest of the expanded universe totally ignored, and they established Jabba the Hutt's father, Zorba the Hutt, um, hmm. 
which I do know. Yes, okay, I do remember Zorba the Hutt. I do remember yes. that from my peripheral reading um, the in the years when there was nothing Star Wars. Mm. Yeah. So, but I don't know about Stinky. Stinky the Hutt. I know Pizza the Hutt from Spaceballs. <laughs> <laughs> So, and I don't remember, and I know the kid's name's not Stinky, but that's just what Ahsoka oh, calls him. So, I don't know, I don't know what's going to transpire, but I think it's going to be a very, like kind of Andor, we're going to get another flavor of Star Wars. I think it's going to be very interesting to see. Yep. Much more grittier than we even got from Mandalorian, so. I, well, I, just, guys... I just think it's, I just also think it's very exciting that this actor who's been, you know, who played Django, and he's been, you know, the clones and all that stuff, he's finally going to get, or just Boa Fett's going to get his own show, and that, to me, it's exciting. That's something that occurred to me watching Mando season two is that that's the first time he's actually gotten to play Boba Fett because he only did the voice in the, um, I don't remember if it was the DVDs or the Blu-rays where they replaced his voice, Yeah, it was but one in of one of the subsequent special editions, they replaced Boba Fett's voice in Empire and Jedi yeah. um, with Tamora Morrison, but he, only, he never played Boba Fett. And no. until now, and now he's mm-hmm. actually getting to play like the most iconic character he's been related to, and it's like. And one last one last exciting. question. One last question. I throw at you guys. Do you feel like it should stay shrouded in mystery, or do you think this series is gonna he's gonna tell the story of how the hell he got out of the Sarlacc pit? Well, they gotta tell the story of how he got out of the Sarlacc pit. But it's probably not any more complicated than he blasted the fuck out of there. But <laughs> I mean, they still gotta show it. They still, you know. I'm more interested with how he got separated from his armor. That's true. Yeah, I want to see. I want to hear about that too. A lot because of... that's the taking the armor from Boba Fett is not going to be a simple feat. Mm-hmm. So. so a lot of good questions to answer, but I I don't know about you guys, but I'm extremely excited for Star Wars now, and I think it wasn't because of the sequel trilogy series; it's because of what's being done with the Mandalorian. Wait, can I just take a moment to tell you guys how I feel about the sequel tri- trilogy film? No, okay. no, no more. <laughs> No more. <laughs> okay. But I just um, Ryan and, have another beer, bud. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse so, me, I, mean, I drink truly gotta watch those carbs. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think we can all agree that the the, it, the outlook now because after the sequel came out, the sequels came out, there was not much known of what was gonna happen with the Star Wars sequels. And it had a very sour taste in our mouths because of Rise of Skywalker, with the exception of James. Um but a lot of people had the sour taste and now with Mandalorian the, it's kind of rejuvenated our faith within the Star Wars franchise. So I think what we're possibly getting with books, comic books, TVs, and movies, I feel like we're probably going to get some some good quality Star Wars that we're hopefully going to I see. Think there's, I think the good's going to come with the bad. I think there's going to be yeah. some not-so-great stuff. There's going to be some really good stuff. Of course, yeah. Because, again, I think that they're just kind of like throwing things against the wall to see what sticks. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think this is going to be the MCU where it's like <clears throat> just about every iteration that comes out is great in its own way. So our mm-hmm. films notwithstanding. Um, Iron Man but, <laughs> right. Um, I, I do think that, I don't know. I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I haven't stopped being excited since uh, they, they announced the sequels because I'm always willing to see where they're going to go with this stuff. So mm-hmm. um, I don't always necessarily like everything, but, that's okay. I don't have to like everything. True. Um, I I can take or leave the sequels, or I can mm-hmm. sorry, I can take or leave the prequels. I don't need to enjoy everything Clone Wars related. Um, you know, there are aspects of both that I enjoy, and there's you know, it's okay to not like everything within a franchise, guys. Like, not you guys, but just people out there. So, yeah. Like yeah, it doesn't all have to be the original trilogy, and the fact that they're exploring so many different time periods so many different types of characters so many different sort of genres now of science fiction adventure action what have you um this is a very exciting time because one of the complaints i kept hearing throughout the um sequel trilogy was oh i'm so tired of the skywalkers and it's like guys the films are about the skywalkers it's always going to be about the skywalkers that's what the Star Wars story films are about. That's like that's why they're doing Solo and all these other ones is because they're getting away from that stuff in other stuff. But the actual like numbered trilogies are always going to be about the Skywalkers because that's what the story is. Not anymore. <laughs> so they're everyone all dead. Who's compla- they everyone who's com- well. everyone who's complaining about that now gets that because they have all these other series and movies going on. So enjoy your smorgasbord. Enjoy your buffet. Mm-hmm. Thank the waitress on your way out. 
That's right. Well, here's what I will say. There's a, a post on um, on Facebook from Bat in the Sun, which is a, a channel I follow, um, which says, uh, it shows J.J. Abrams saying, this is an actual quote, we can't satisfy the original trilogy fans. Well, I guess it's not an actual quote, but it's something. We can't satisfy the original trilogy fans while also appealing to a new younger audience. And then John Favreau saying, hold my beer. Hold my beer. <laughs> right? I mean, he did. I mean, I feel like, I feel like what John Favreau and, and uh, Dave Filoni did was what, I feel like is what they did. They, they turned into little kids and they're like, you know what? We have all these toys. Let's just make our, like, you know what kids, like you have your action figures, you make your own little stories, you go along with, what happens if we take this character and combine with this character? Let's find out. Like, you know, like they just, they're basically kids playing with toys and making stories as they go along. To the but point where one of my favorite things about, especially the second season was um, the episode where they go to the, um, where Apollo Creed and um, <laughs> Muscles go with um, Mando to um, the Imperial Station. One of the vehicles that they, the, the vehicle that they steal is inspired by a toy. One of yeah. the most jankiest, ridiculous Star Wars toys ever, where it's literally just a hunk of plastic where you put the stormtroopers in the side of the thing and you can open a door and put a little pilot inside. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I love that they are drawing inspiration from just anywhere in the universe and making things that, like, it's a stupid toy. Like, it's, but everybody it's just, had it, and it's so cool that it's now canon. Like, mm -hmm. they've made it into an actual thing, so it's like, yeah, sure, the toy's actually based on something in Star Wars, not just something we made to sell, you know, to put with your action figures. Right. I mean, and spoiler warning here, folks, but just, the like, yeah, heavy spoiler, Ryan, you got to probably put up a spoiler thing, but just, the, like, if you know the lore of Bo-Katan, and you know her story from all her things, just, the, it was like, it's that same idea. It's like the idea of Bo-Katan and Luke Skywalker in the same room. You know what I mean? Like, it's just stuff like that. Like, there's moments like that where you know all the history and lore. It's like, it's so cool what they're doing. And I feel like as long, they haven't announced it yet, but as long as John Favreau and or Dave Filoni have their hands in a lot of this stuff moving forward, as long as having their hands in it, you know what I mean? I feel like we're, we will be in a much better place in Star Wars. But I think, I think um, John Favreau has become the Kevin Foggy of he should this side of become it. Or he Dave Filoni. Either one. Well, Dave, Dave Filoni is more of the. Um, he's not a good executive. He's writer. a good storyteller. Yeah. Yeah. He's not a good executive, but John Favreau is. Yeah. And I, I hate that you know, because I mean everybody wants to hate Kathleen Kennedy, and I I, I I feel like she does need to step away, and John Favreau needs to come along. But I mean, give credit where it is due that John Favreau did approach Kathleen Kennedy with the Mandalorian, and she greenlit it. So I mean, it has she has to be involved in the in the in the applause for the mandalorian but um i just feel like it, because because of the original trilogy and the lack of leadership of it i feel like it's just someone needs to step forward now to move forward well she also had to agree to all this stuff too like nothing true. gets by her so oh that's true oh yeah so she we'll, just we'll needs see. to go back to being by steven spielberg's side and doing with i don't know i yeah. i don't know I, I i i haven't forgiven her for the sequel trilogy but we'll we'll see she's she's a we'll good see. Yeah, we'll see. But all right, folks, that'll do for tonight. Thank you very much for listening to us here. I know you don't really see our faces, but we appreciate you listening to us. And more importantly, what which series or movie or book are you most excited for? Leave your comments in the section below and let us know your thoughts. Also, if you like what you watch, guys, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel so you can receive more of our various content in the future. Also, like us on Facebook and Twitter. The links will be in the description below, as always. All right, folks, that'll do us again. Again, I'm Josh Williams. And I'm Ryan Murphy. And I'm James Sheridan. And thank you for keeping it real. With real time. Good night.